Hello, my name is Jim Brosnahan. I'm a trial lawyer with the firm of Morrison Forrester in San Francisco. In 10 minutes, I'm going to give you 10 things as a young lawyer that will help you give a better final argument, no matter how good you might be already, or no matter how inexperienced you might be. The first of those 10 things is you have to know your audience. The history of trial is 2,000 years old by my reckoning, and there's been no book written about how to do it that doesn't refer to knowing your audience. What does that mean? You not only have to look at them, you have to see them. You have to see who they are. You have to know what's going on in that community. You have to know how young people feel about things, how older people feel about things. You have to know your audience. Why? Because your final argument has to be adapted to them. I've seen many examples of the reverse in courtrooms over the years. And you just have to know your audience. You have to know who you're talking to. So that's number one. Number two, you have to retain your credibility. And that's harder than it sounds like. You've got credibility starting with the judge and with the jury. It's very tempting in the middle of the trial. I think I've had perhaps 150 trials. It's very tempting suddenly to react, to respond. And before you know it, you've said something that doesn't sound very good. And there's a little nick in your credibility. By the time you get to the end of the trial, that jury has to see you as a teacher, as a responsible person, there are examples, uh, many perhaps, where you have to fight very hard during the trial. But retaining your credibility is number two. It will help a lot in delivery of the final argument. Number three, what is it the jury is going to do? I confess it took me about 15 years to really understand this. And having watched a lot of mock trials and mock arguments and talking to jurors and all that, I now want to share with you what I think they're going to do. No matter where you're trying cases, they're going to take the law from the judge. They're going to treat it seriously. They're going to take the facts in the case, and they're going to put them together. If you have 12 people in a criminal case, or even eight people in a civil case, that is collective intelligence. They are very smart. Forgive me if I suggest that they're smarter than I am and they're smarter than you are. So you have to be dealing on a respectful level with whoever it is you're trying to persuade. This isn't the only way to do these things. It's my way, but I've seen a lot of lawyers do, do it properly, and I've seen a few who didn't do these things, and I recommend that you do what I'm saying in these things so far. Using word pictures marks the good advocate, and great word pictures marks the great advocate. I'll give you a civil example and a criminal example. In a civil case, you could say, he signed the contract. Or you could say, if it was true in the case, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he sat there in his office, as you heard, knowing that he had just sent an email which said, we can break this contract uh, if we want to. And that email was contained in that computer that sat on his desk. Knowing that he said that, he took that pen in his hand looked down at the contract, and signed it with all of the promises contained therein. On the criminal side, you could say the defendant was accused of arson. Uh, he was by himself. He didn't have an alibi. Or if you're defending, you could say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he was prepared to take his new friend to Monterey for a dancing festival. He was excited about it. That was the evidence. He was looking forward to it. He went home. He went to sleep. He was by himself. As are, as you heard, 30% of Americans are by themselves. The prosecution says he doesn't have an alibi. 
You mean every single person in America every night has to get somebody to be with them so they have an alibi if they happen to be in Modesto? You get the idea. Word pictures. Five, rhetoric is a good thing. And I put it that way because we don't like the word and we don't even like the sound of it because it means advertising, it means excessive talk and so forth. But there are maybe 25 techniques in the books on rhetoric and I commend to you getting a good one. And there are many, they're, they're very cheap. Uh, you can get old used ones and so forth. Get a book on rhetoric and look at it and think about how you would uh, apply those things. For example, most of those lists start with a good beginning, a good ending. They talk about word pictures. They talk about your voice, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which is a very important subject for all of us. The books on rhetoric also want you to be able to tell a story. Some young lawyers say, well, I'm not good at telling stories until you see them talking to their niece or nephew who has asked them, begged them to tell them a story, and suddenly they're magnificent. It's the same thing in the courtroom. Here's what happened. You don't say once upon a time, but otherwise you take them through exactly what happened with the details. So get yourself a book on rhetoric and use it and apply it and some of those techniques you'll find extremely helpful. Six, how do you use exhibits? There's a lot of exhibits you can use. Of course, if you show them the picture of the bruise here in your personal injury case, that will be impactful in a way that just talking about it is not. The point I want to make here is simplify it. I was in a criminal trial years ago and there was a great lawyer there and he had three cups and he was moving the three cups. The jury was mesmerized. I can't tell you what his point was, but I remember we won the case because he had three cups. And I've used three cups now in about six or seven cases. Seven, marshalling the evidence. There's all the evidence there. Ladies and gentlemen, there are 32 examples of X, and as to Y, there are no examples. That's marshalling the evidence. Eight, pull the string of all the bad evidence. You must deal with, not overdo it, you must deal with all the bad arguments. You have to give your best argument on all the bad arguments. Nine, the importance of the voice. The voice, most lawyers are not trained in the voice, which to me is extremely odd. I do teach voice to uh, various lawyers and also in my class that I teach at Bolt Hall, and it's very important. Now, the elements of the voice are the sound, the volume, it's got to go out there. The tempo, how fast are you talking? Are you talking too fast? Are you proud of the fact that you talk fast? The emphasis. This is more important than the others. The clarity. Do you let it, the voice fall off at the end and so forth and so, you know, so that those jurors don't get the really important point? And what which words are you going to emphasize with your voice? Practice. Take that iPhone in your bag or in your pocket, take it out, film yourself, listen to it, and do it again. And do it again. And do it again. 40% of you will find it difficult to use emotion. All of us went to law school, paid a lot of money, and were told emotion's bad. Well, in the courtroom, when you're giving a final argument, emotion can be the winner, and you need to practice it. So work hard on the voice, two hours a month for a while. Just say to yourself, you're going to do it. Two hours a month. And finally, something that will sound like it's inconsistent with the first nine, but it's really right there. You always have to be yourself. You can have a style, 
It might be very different than mine. It might be very different than other lawyers. But you have to be yourself. So be a collector of arguments that you find from other lawyers. Thank you very much.